Thank you all for joining this Cambium Networks Wireless Works uh, webcast podcast. Uh, we're talking today about Teragraph Mesh, two words that uh, maybe don't seem to go together in natural language. Uh, the word mesh, we know that word. It's been around a long time, but we're going to tell you some things that maybe you didn't know about mesh. We're going to change your thinking a little bit about that four-letter word. And we're going to talk about Teragraph because really those two go together nicely. With us today is David Botha from Facebook. He's our st a strategic partner manager at Facebook. Uh, Dave's got lots of experience. He's, he's one of those smart guys. Uh, he's the guy in the room and knows how every, all the electronics works. He has a master's in electrical engineering, but he's, his focus has been on, on wireless networks and developing wireless products. He's going to talk about some of the key concepts that drives the Teragraph from uh, value and performance. Also with us is Anthony Holmes from Cambium Networks. His title is VP of Engineering Millimeter Wave, but Anthony, I think you've done a few more things. Well, one or two, yes. Uh, quite a lot of the Cambium product range. Uh, it's been about 27 years in wireless. Uh, so, so Anthony is the guy uh, you know, from, the, from the, uh, the farmer's insurance commercial that says, I've, I've seen a thing or two, so I know a thing or two. Uh, David, do you want to go introduce yourself? I didn't give you the chance to do that. Sure. No, thanks, Darren. Thanks for the glowing intro. I'm uh, yeah, Dave Buerta. I'm actually a strategic partnerships uh, manager at Facebook now. Uh, indeed, my background is technical, uh, double E and product management, all in the realm of wireless connectivity. Um, and I've been at Facebook uh, about three years now, uh, working uh, predominantly on the Terragraph program, which we'll, we'll be discussing at length here. So thanks for having me on. Very welcome. Let's, let's jump right into it. So Dave, since you're right, uh, right up, uh, first up first up to bat here, what is Terragraph? So Terragraph is one of several um, connectivity projects uh, in Facebook. We've got a, a connectivity organization, which has a mission to connect people uh, or get people online to a faster internet is actually the mission, I think almost verbatim. Uh, Terragraph in particular took a look at um, a problem statement, which is um, perhaps last mile or distribution uh, connectivity where if you want to connect people at gigabit per second or higher speeds, um, you know, the de facto standard there has been fiber, fiber connectivity. And fiber is a great technology. Um, obviously it's, you know, very high capacity, very reliable, but it's also very expensive and takes a long time to deploy. So, you know, in the connectivity mission at Facebook, we took a look at this, um, let's say hurdle to connecting at this speed and, and looked at wireless alternatives and you know options to basically reduce the the cost and the time to connect uh, people to the internet at, at this category of, of connectivity um, and basically Terragraph pulled together a number of very interesting elements um, from 60 gigahertz spectrum uh, mesh routing protocols um, you know we can get into some of the details a bit more but stitch these pieces together to uh, essentially provide um, an alternative, also a complement to fiber uh, to, to really resolve these challenges. So uh, it's been a great, uh, very exciting program. It's an exciting time for the program. We've partnered very closely with um, you know, a number of, of OEMs, including Cambium Networks, um, to actually commercialize the technology. And now we're finally seeing it actually hit the market. Um, so glad we get to discuss it a bit here. Good. So, so Anthony, uh, what, what, is, what does all that mean to you and to Cambium? Well, what it means, as you know, you know Cambium has got so many different wireless technologies and uh, different ways of getting broadband to the masses, whether it's uh, point to point, um, point to multi-point or massive new MIMO. And we've been looking at how do we get that data rate up? How do we get into gigabit rates? And you know, for about 10 years now, I've been trying to find a 60 gigahertz solution. And it really wasn't until uh, Terragraph came along that we felt that there was a solution that, that we could actually stand behind and get to the marketplace and would actually work. And you know, what we're finding is this, this is working. You know, it's providing that, uh, uh, that fiber-like performance uh, in gigabit wireless connectivity. So very resilient, very, um, very expandable and, uh, and adaptable. Good. So with, the, with those high level sort of objectives in mind, let's, let's drill into a little bit about the, a little bit of the technology that delivers that value. Um, you know, uh, Dave, you're talking about the, the value of connecting people. Um, uh, Anthony, I mean, 10 years looking, looking for a solution is a long time. 
Um, let, let's talk about what what happens here. What what's causing this? So one of the things uh, that, that we, we talk about with Terragraph is a distributed architecture. Um, and if we can get, get into that a little bit more, please, um, Anthony, would you want to kick us off there with uh, talk about some of those things that makes this um, in terms of distributed architecture aspects of Terragraph? So as distributed architecture is concerned, is it's really being able to get closer to your, your customer. And uh, the, the normal way that we've been doing radios in the past is, is very much the you know beam into an area. Um, and what we you know what we find you that's very good with CBRS frequencies, with sub six frequencies, but you know, they're getting busy and, and not providing the, the gigabit rates. So it's really how to get closer to your client to utilize 60 gigahertz. And obviously some of the things about 60 gigahertz, you need that line of sight, the ranges are shorter. So by distributing your network in closer to the ground, getting from the, the mast into the street corner is where this technology really works. You have the scalability, you get the density, but it's not just about smart cities and, and high density. Rural communities can benefit as well, as well as industrial applications. And you know, we, we'll talk more about those. I, I like that. I'm gonna I'm gonna remember that phrase, uh, turning non-line of sight into a line of sight topology. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to think about that a little bit more, Anthony. All right. So moving on here, um, Dave. What else? Is, what goes into this uh, in terms of from, from Facebook side? What can you give us a give us a technical nugget on your experience that uh, plays a part in Terragraph? Sure, certainly. And I and I realized too, Darren, when I answered your question earlier, maybe I didn't address exactly what Facebook has done in this in this ecosystem as well. So I think important to understand right when we when we undertook this problem to solve in the connectivity realm and we con conceived of Terragraph, um, you know, basically what that meant is we invested in a bunch of R&D um, to uh, come up with a solution to this problem. Um, and, and effectively this resulted in a, um, um, let's say a bunch of intellectual property software, uh, various ecosystem developments that we um, uh, helped, you know, uh, drive. Um, and important to understand that Facebook is not an OEM or a, a service provider in this context. So all of this intellectual property IP, everything that is Terragraph, we partner with the ecosystem to commercialize. So it's been licensed to Cambium and other OEMs to produce. Now, if, if I break it down a little bit further and maybe get into some of the technical nuggets of what that are, you know, Darren, you asked um, what, what some of the other technical pieces were. There's an important concept um, that we borrowed um, actually interestingly from our, um, you know, basically our server farms as Facebook, uh, you know, uh, we had to solve this problem or consider the problem of, you know, do you, when you render a, a service that you need to be highly reliable, resilient, uh, always available, um, you can do so in a, with a server that is, you know, at a very, let's say, high grade, high industrial grade, high availability server that's also very expensive. But another way to skin that cat or solve that problem and ultimately what Facebook has ended up doing is, you know, invest in, uh, um, let's say a fleet or a number of lower cost servers that then can uh, fail over. And as long as you manage these, this fleet of lower cost servers, um, you know, appropriately, you can render a very high availability service um, you know, and, and there's a number of very positive attributes to, to solving the problem that way. And Terragraph actually takes so many pages out of that book. It, it's really um, a nice reuse of that concept. So um, I think we were talking earlier that it, it, in some ways it's like the, the um, telco version of, of managing a uh, server farm that way, right? Build in high availability, reliability through redundancy uh, of lower cost elements. So, so similar in the telco space, you could conceive of fiber as being the high reliability, always available uh, infrastructure option. But now we're looking at a lower cost alternative that can render similar availability. Um, and so Terragraph basically takes the 60 gigahertz unlicensed spectrum, unlicensed in many parts of the world. So it's, it's inexpensive to use. Um, uses essentially uh, merchant silicon to to um, you know implement the the uh, the millimeter wave.
technology. So the, the gear itself is low cost compared to, you know, licensed um, uh, millimeter wave or microwave gear. And we build these sort of layers of, of um, redundancy through things like Terragraph Mesh, which allows, you know, you, you to deploy a fleet of these radios in an area um, and, and build in this type of, of say, failover resilience um, in, into that network. So, so, so today you talked about high availability being kind of the, the end objective here. High availability with using using low cost nodes and that sort of telecom version of a, a routed data center. So, Anthony, how do we how do we how do we do that? You know, what, what's how do we build that layer that level of um, network reliability uh, through through the, this protocol suite? Well, I think this this is all the tools that we've been given uh, is is what makes this so reliable at every layer we have redundancy and resilience built in. If you look at layer one, layer two, the Mac the Phi uh, that has been part of Terragraph and has been introduced as part of the .11AY standard, you know, what you have there is, is a whole raft of different things that you can play with, link, adapti link adaptability, um, transmit power control, beamforming of the antennas, um, link impairment detection if, if you have errors uh, in your detection uh, in your uh, network, uh, block acts as well, all make this layer one, layer two very reliable. But then you then step up to layer three, and this is where David's talking about uh, the, the meshing protocols at layer three with the open R um, protocol there, where each one of those nodes is gathering information for, from other nodes, uh, has a keeper life between them. So as soon as one of those goes down, it's detected and can be re and everything can be rerouted. Now, the convergence on that rerouting is, is almost instantaneous because the, you're, you're keeping a forward looking uh, database of, well, what's my next best path? And that's all being collected constantly as, as the network is, is uh, running. But then on top of that, you've got a layer four, BGP. We're using BGP in there in order to, uh, to zone off um, areas. So using uh, longest prefix matches and things like that, you're able to have different zones within your network. And again, that's got resilience in there. If any of those paths goes down, the open R clicks in, paths change, BGP updates, and you get a, you get a new route. All on top of that, you've then got uh, the uh, the controlling mechanism, the high availability redundant controlling system, multiple pops, CM Maestro coming along managing it all. Um, it, it enables you to 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 do many things to make sure that your network not only is providing gigabit uh, uh, access, but is is, is uh, resilient. So Dan, Anthony, there, there has to be a controller function here. Um, you mentioned CN Maestro is one of those layers of management, but there has to be other controllers, things that are establishing those routes, uh, decision yeah. trees. What, what what happens and how do we build more resilience into that layer? Well, the the actual uh, building the uh, the trees, um, et cetera, is actually done within the nodes. Ah. So, so all the routing tables and the resilience there is in the nodes. That means that if management goes down, it will carry on, right? Um, so so you're not, you haven't got a single point of failure here. So, so as far as rerouting is concerned, that's quick. As I said, the convergence is pretty much um, instantaneous. As soon as you detect that a link's gone, bang, you, 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 it knows the next route to go to instantly. So, so, you might lose, so you might lose some statistics, but you won't lose the network. Absolutely, absolutely. But, um, you know, there is a controller, a centralized controller here, mm -hmm. and centralized controllers doing a huge amount of work. Um, again, uh, with Facebook, uh, they've, um, we're working on things called uh, network analysis, network optimization, where we're constantly looking at the network to improve uh, the, the, uh, how, it, how it operates in interference. So, you know, lots of things going on here to optimize and improve the network constantly. Wow, um, that, that, that's a fantastic technical dive. I think you, both of you have really highlighted uh, some of the underlying um, um, design architecture that that's led to this uh, this product and that really inherently designed it for uh, for this high availability. So let's uh, let's let's do some redirection here. Let's talk about um, Anthony. You, you mentioned earlier in introduction that your experience twenty seven years in wireless. So can can you sort of put this in context, if you if you will? 
Um, you know, you've done a lot of fixed wireless solutions. You worked with this technology for a lot of years. Just help us to put this 60 gigahertz teragraph solution in context with other fixed wireless broadband. Yeah, well, we, we've put a lot of, of new technology to the marketplace. Um, you know, some, some of the innovations like massive new MIMO, for example, uh, where we're, we're doing beamforming and beam steering. Now, what you, what you get with 60 gigahertz is all this packed into a tiny little space. Um, and yet it's still providing gigabits of, of, of data. So 10 time, a tenth of the size, you can have a 60 gigahertz radio doing beamforming. And um, what, what's great about this, it's not just about at the access point, it's at the subscriber end as well. So you've actually now got both sides being able to do that beamforming, which means that it's easier to install and uh, more reliably, um, uh, installations can be more reliable as well. Uh, how does, I, I don't sorry, you have to explain that to me. How, how, does, how does that help? How does beam steering help installation? It sounds hard. It, it does, you, millimeter wave, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm envisioning, I'm envisioning this sort of a small beam and somehow you're telling me to you know put that thing through a little spy hole how do we how, how are we helping the installation uh, this is where i get to use my uh, my favorite acronym the edmg <laughs> the enhanced directional multi gigabit antenna this 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 is these are these tiles and um, they they have multiple elements in there now what you do with uh, you can change the phase of each one of these elements and by changing the phase of each one of these elements you're able to form a beam a very tight micro beam and these these beams uh, and you, you can form um, 112 of these beams for example on a single on 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 these tiles and that's how you get the directionality on there and uh, what you would do is, is it will automatically do a scan, it finds out where the clients are, and it creates that beam specifically to that client. That may, basically reduces interference. Um, it also gives you a lot more power. Um, it, it concentrates the power to that subscriber unit. You're not flooding the whole area with a lot of noise like, uh, like mesh systems used to do, where they, they're working on a sector basis or, a, or a, uh, an omni basis. They're very directional beams to each one of those clients. Well, so, so David, how does that, is there any benefit to that if these highly directional beams What's the benefit in terms of your channel planning? It seems seems to me that there's a there's a logical uh, benefit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a good a good point. You know, I think one of the the um, perhaps knee jerk concerns when we talk about sixty gigahertz is that it's unlicensed, and you know, what about uh, interference between nodes, etc. But uh, when you're actually forming links through these pencil beams, you know, you have to remember it's actually a very constrained radiation pattern. So. Uh, just forming these beams and connecting nodes through these phased arrays that do so, basically all the energy is just going node to node and it's not really bleeding to neighboring nodes and, and vice versa. So it's actually a very powerful tool to help um, you know, mitigate self-interference and it also enables a very highly efficient use of the spectrum. In fact, we can deploy hundreds of teragraph nodes in a network all using the same channel, the same two gigahertz channel and 60 gigahertz, in part because of this property. Absolutely. There was one other, one other comment I wanted to make about it, just emphasizing something Anthony was describing about how these nodes actually find each other in this way. That's a very important part of the Terragraph technology too, is sort of abstracting that complexity from the installation team, from the service provider, right? These nodes actually, after a very crude alignment, just get the nodes roughly, you know, I think you can sort of put them within plus minus 25 degrees off azimuth pointing at each other, which you can do without any special tools. They thereafter can find each other and form the optimal, um, you know, beam between, between nodes to form these high capacity links. So very simple from a user or let's say installer standpoint. Anthony, you, what, what, Anthony what capacity are we talking about here? So what we're talking about is it, it, at around about 200 meters, you can get gigabit capacity. So yes. you're going to get a gigabit link up. Um, now it depends on rain, uh, rain regions, but you know we have planning tools to help with that in order to to maximize the throughput per range. But you know as you know that's but again with a distributed network, you can always bring your network closer to to the users. Um, plus the fact using uh, you know, we actually have the ability because uh, everything's a lot smaller. 
you know, we can have a very high gain antenna in quite a compact um, form factor now. The V3000 uh, with, with a small antenna on there is, 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 is got a 40, 45 dBi antenna on this. You know, something like that in, in sub six would be absolutely enormous, you know, so, just all manageable. So, so Anthony, let me let me uh, let me just give you some some boundary conditions here from a sort of a network designer sort of put these some things in perspective. So, let, let's you said you said two hundred meters um, break the gigabit barrier, right about a gigabit. Um, let, let's let's book in that. Let, let's start at one hundred meters, um, you know, between between nodes, and let's look at maybe what three hundred meters between nodes. Um, if we sort of book into a little bit, what are we what are you looking at at one hundred meters? Um, what, what kind of throughput can we get if we if we bond all the available channels? Well, at the uh, so what we would do um, coming up in the next release, we can channel bond uh, two channels. So with with this, uh, the dot eleven ay eventually will let you channel bond all eight if you, um, or uh, four channels if you want to. Okay. But um, but what we're looking at with Terragraph at the moment is your your channel bond two. And at 100 meters, you can get data rates in each direction of around about 2.8 gigabits per second um, would, would be about the, uh, the, um, the data rate you'll get. Okay, so so 2.8 gigabits per second. In um, each direction, uplink and downlink. I'm sorry, what was that? In uplink and downlink, so in total. Yes, bi-directional. Okay, good. And then, and so, and so that's with two, two channels bonded. And then the, the the technology can actually has a has a for, has a roadmap path towards bonding four. Can well, I, the sta the standard allows you to bond four. Yes, okay. um, that'll be in the future. Okay, in the, so so is that effectively double the two point eight? Yes, it it would. Yes. Okay. Wow. Uh, yeah, that that's, that's some big numbers there. So so there there you go. So now you're we're actually quite a bit higher than we've actually blown through that that gigabit barrier. Because I was. I was trying to get my wrap my head around this gigabit link. We've, we've been trying to get gigabit in wireless for a long time. And, and I, you know, I really hate this sort of the consumer products, you know, the things you buy, you put it in your home and they have these crazy things like, you know, AC 3400, which sort of implies it's 3.4 gigabits per second, but you'll never see more than 200 off of it. You wonder why. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm always looking for that technology that's going to break that gigabit uh, barrier. And I, I think this is, this is, this is it. This is neat. This is neat stuff. Oh. You know, we, we also have clients like the V3000, though, where you will get you will get that sort of data rate at 600 meters. So, wow. you know, it really does depend on the, the gain that you have on those antennas. And as I say, so, so you know, the, the ranges, depending on the uh, depending on the range, depending on the product can go from uh, hundreds of you know, 100 meters to 600 meters to one kilometer. Yeah, we, we have links out there that were over a kilometer getting 1.8 gigabits per second. So I'm, I'm, you see, then, then I, I was thinking 300, 400, 450 meters as my upper boundary, but you just sort of blew that out the wall, out the door as well. It's a common, it's a common misperception, I think, around 60 gigahertz, right? That it has to yeah. be very close range. And people forget that actually, you know, classic link budget applies. If you have higher antenna gain, uh, you know, you can actually budget for longer. Uh, longer link distances. So that's that's why you guys are here. That's why I'm not doing this thing on my own. Wow, uh, so that, that's fantastic. Would you, you guys have just gone through several several things. Um, I got a new acronym to look up, uh, EDMG, Enhanced Directional Multi-Gig Antenna. Um, benefits there, what you talked about, Anthony, really is this, and David, about this massive channel reuse, which is a brand new concept for me. In terms of network architecture, something I got to wrap my head around that and the impacts of network architecture that can actually scale the hundreds of nodes, Dave, you said, uh, all using essentially the same frequency. So we have massive channel reuse. Of course, you have to do some design work on those things. This is why this is how we're turning this non line of sight into an effectively line of sight. What this is to me when I'm when you're listening to you guys talk, what I'm hearing is this is this is really a fiber equivalent link. Uh, because of the, the nature of that tight beam, uh, you pair that with a fast routing, uh, near real-time failover that you guys talked about with Terragraph, um, and, and all of a sudden you have a network that really exceeds the, those, those availability and resiliency and performance requirements. So, so that, that, that's, that, that's an amazing technology. I like it. 
let's uh, let's find out where we can use this stuff. Um, I, I like you guys just to talk about what do you you know we can't talk about every technology. You could, but I like to know what your favorites are. Give me give me a couple, Dave. Um, give me a couple of your favorite use cases where people could sure. use this technology. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, important to to view it just broadly, right? Effectively, anywhere where you're looking to distribute multi gigabit capacity uh, falls into fair game as as far as use case goes. I mean, a classic scenario is you've got some fiber point of presence, say fiber to the curve or some asset uh, somewhere in a in an area, and you want to now distribute that either to connect subscribers through you know fixed wireless access. Uh, you or say a fixed broadband connection, or perhaps you want to backhaul some APs, uh, Wi-Fi APs or small cells, for example, in an area. Um, you know, Teragraph is applicable to all these things. I, I would say that you know we've seen initial traction most strongly in the fixed wireless access use case because Teragraph just fits very well there. You've got client nodes that can reside on uh, subscriber premises and they talk very nicely to the uh, you know they, they fit seamlessly in fact into the uh, the telegraph mesh but from there you know there's also of course applicability in use cases such as wi-fi backhaul such as small cell backhaul um, i would say that you know as facebook of course we're very interested in all the people connectivity use cases because that's our mission but Teragraph fits beyond just people connectivity use cases. There are industrial applications, oil and gas, um, secu physical security, you know, security camera back wall that Teragraph also fits very well as a, as a use case. So very, uh, very broad, uh, uh, let's say, field of, of possibilities with Teragraph. That's nice. That's nice. Anthony, do you have a, you've been, you've been leading the team developing this and uh, what's your, what's, what's popping out for you? Gosh, it's like trying to pick your favorite son, isn't it, or child? Uh, no, it's um, no. It, we actually have thousands of units out in the field. We, we've been shipping this now since October and last year. So, you know, it, it's amazing just how diverse the the usage of this is. From smart city, uh, where we're we're getting reports back where people are, are connecting with Wi-Fi devices. Um, through through the APs connected to distribution nodes, connected back to the pop, and they're getting 200 megabits per second um, on the street corner. And then we also then get residential rural units uh, where customers are saying, well, you know, I'm getting 1.8 gigabits per second uh, by directional rates. So when I used to get, uh, you know, sort of like seven meg before. Um, but I think it's important to, to know that uh, th this, this is fiber-like technology, but it's you know, in partnership with fiber, it makes a great, it is a great partnership. You use the fiber as your pop, your backhaul, and then you then distribute that around an area, as I say, whether it's rural, whether it's smart city, whether it's industrial, there's so many different applications that we're seeing throughout the world. It's, it's, it's just a great technology. Yeah, we, we used to always think of, uh, you know, in, in, in the enterprise networking, you know, we used to always think of the, the wired connection, the fiber is as your high speed backbone. And then you're, you're sort of, uh, you know, you're sort of dropping that down, you're rate adapting that down once you hit sort of a standard Wi-Fi access point. That, that's been sort of the, you know, you're, you're, not, you're never going to see the full speed of your, your backhaul. But I think with Teragraph, we're now seeing that, that we can actually deliver that full capacity. Which is which is really a fantastic thing to, to do. So in the enterprise networks, that's kind of my background. Um, as I'm listening to you guys, you guys talking about this, uh, I'm thinking about you know sort of the networks I've been involved with and some some people that I work with, and and I see lots of adjacency, lots of adjacent uh, market opportunities for people that have experience with enterprise Wi-Fi deployment. So you take a company that maybe uh, maybe they're building. Um, Wi-Fi in a warehouse or a light industrial facility, and they're they're doing all the indoor stuff, and they're worried about all of the you know the RF propagation inside of a building, and that's that's what they do. But then they also need to interconnect those buildings. Uh, Dave, you mentioned uh, security cameras. Well, these industrial facilities, uh, transportation yards, um, higher education campuses, right? They they put security cameras on the perimeters uh, just for lots of reasons. There's lots of security reasons. There's lots of personal safety reasons. Uh, that to do that and and uh the, the buildings weren't designed for that that type of infrastructure and so teragraph gives you that and so i, I see lots of applications extending the enterprise uh, wi-fi to network topology to to outdoors and picking up all these different uh use cases and applications well i'll tell you um 
I think we could have gone a, a bit more. Um, in terms of our technical deep dive, you, you guys really give me some things to think about. Um, talking about the, uh, the, the multi-layer resiliency, uh, Anthony was pretty, it was pretty informative to me and eye-opening. You know, layer one all the way to the layer four and the upper layers, uh, each layer have its own, its own design of, of resiliency for, for um, you know, avail high availability. Uh, Dave, I, I, like, I like this concept of, of bringing this technology from the, from the data center and applying it to the telecom world, uh, this sort of re high resilient routing, uh, protocols of multiple low-cost nodes working together in coordination. Uh, that's that's fantastic. Uh, and then and then and then at the end of the day, we're you know we're delivering these speeds that are multi-gigabit. We're bar completely blown through that gigabit barrier. Um, that's what we're going to need. You know, the future is going to be uh, augmented reality. I was talking to a guy the other day who discussed using augmented reality for his network designs for an urban network. So he was he had to you know he had a, a basic idea as to where he needed to install things, but he put his AR goggles on, went to Google Street View, then he could, you know, he could look. Yes, that's where this thing goes, that where that's where that goes. Well, augmented reality, there's so many applications for that. And, and all of these things, that's just one of the many, uh, they're going to require lower latency, higher speeds, and there's more of them. It's not just the low latency, the higher speeds, but it's everyone's going to be doing it. So you've got capacity that has to come into, into that equation as well. So I like this. I, I think this is uh, really setting the future and uh, giving us a whole new set of tools. Thank you guys for joining. Thank you very much, Darren. This was an interesting conversation and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Anthony. I know it's uh, late for you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, any final thoughts? No, just um, great technology to turn that non-Lanocyte into Lanocyte. Wonderful. Thank you all very much. Have a great day.